Hi, this is Michael Buffer, and welcome to the Box Hard Podcast. Hello, everyone. This is Mikey Garcia. It's the monster from the swamp, Regis Rougarou Program. Hey, what's up? This is King Carlos Polina, former IBF world champ. This is Michael, the bounty hunter, 2012 Olympian and your people's champ. This is Charlie Edwards, flyweight champion of the world. This is Fast Eddie Chambers, and you're listening to the Box Hard Podcast with my main man, Joey Coastman. Hello, everybody, and welcome to episode 372 of the Box Hard Podcast. I'm your host, Joey Coastman. I'm joined, as ever, by former heavyweight world title challenger, my co-host, Mr. Fast Eddie Chambers. Eddie, how you doing this week, my man? I'm doing good, my man. How about you? Always good when speaking with you, Eddie. That's the truth. Going to dive straight into the review part of the show. Let's start here with this one. It took place last Friday, November 25th, at the Zenith Metropole in Nantes, Nantes uh, in, in, in France over here. David Papon, um, or Papon, I think it's said, like I say, now 27-0 and 0 with that one draw. A unanimous decision there over 12 rounds against Bilal Jikatu, former opponent of Sam Eggington, gave Sam Eggington a really good fight. Um, about a year and a half ago. Uh, that one was for the IBA World Super Welterweight title. Uh, moving out now to the York Hall Bethnal Green again on the Friday. Two fights to mention over here. Both guys, friends of the show, Harlem Eubank and Liam Williams. Let's start with Harlem Eubank now, 16-0. and Um I expected him to win on points, and he did. Good money on that, by the way. Um, Harlem Eubank now, like I say, 16-0, and 0, a 10-round unanimous decision over the, the very tough and game Tom Farrell, who did have a moment during, I think, the fourth round or the fifth round or something like that. But, um, yeah, the little bits I did see of it, it seemed like Harlem Eubank was primarily in control, really, for most of the fight. Um, Tom Farrell still only been stopped just just the one time in his six losses, that one time to O'Hara Davies, who can bang, who is massive for the weight. Uh, moving out, or not moving out, moving down the card to this one as well. Liam Williams now 24-4 and four with a draw. He successfully bounced back after losing to Chris Eubank Jr. last time out. A TKO in round two against Nizar Trimetch, who's now 9-4 and four with a couple of draws. Um, Trimetch down in the first round um yeah, it was just a complete and utter mismatch, really. We knew what it was. It was just simply a comeback fight for Liam Williams to look good. Um, it was great that the fight was on terrestrial TV. He got the job done. Um, you know, I I feel for, for Liam Williams. I think he's had a very unlucky career, you know. Um, I don't think he's with a big promoter anymore as well, if I'm not mistaken. I'm not entirely sure he's actually with the Sourlands. Um, I know it was a Sourland card, but I'm not entirely sure he's with them. Uh, maybe he signed some kind of deal when he fought Eubank. But um, it's it's a great shame, really, because, you know, I think he was unlucky in, I think it was the first fight with, with Liam Smith, you know, losing his O. Um, obviously, come back, um, had the rematch with Liam Smith. I honestly can't remember how that one went. Um, he seemed to just improve, though, and... The whole game improved. He started knocking people out. Then he obviously fought Demetrius Andrade. And I thought that he would give Andrade a really good fight. I, I favoured Andrade. But I thought that, you know, this guy is probably going to be a future world champion. But obviously Andrade um, obviously beat him. Looked really good in doing so. I think dropped him early if my memory serves me right. Um, Liam Williams did have a few moments late on in the fight. Again, if my memory serves me right. And then he got the fight with Eubank and obviously was down about 17 times. And to see him back now, you know, at this point in his career, I know he's he's back now with Gary Lockett, which is a man he started his boxing career with. Um, I just don't really see him becoming a world champion. But at one point, I was almost certain he would become a world champion. So I feel I feel like his career is kind of, yeah, it's been a bit unlucky, man. Um the last couple of years, the last three years, whatever, obviously was with Frank Warren, um, no longer with him. Uh, moving out now to this one, it took place at the Hilton Palm Jumere in Dubai, over here. It wasn't on TV in the UK at least, but the main event was Jamie Mitchell. I was talking about 
Jamie Mitchell last week. I said that perhaps if she would win the fight, maybe we could get her on the podcast. She's now 8-1 and one with two draws. She lost the WBA Bantamweight World title um, to Nina Hughes of the UK, who's now 5-0, and oh, a unanimous decision over 10 two-minute rounds, like I say. Um, didn't see the fight, not going to pretend I have, but brilliant for Nina Hughes, who... I couldn't get any odds on the fight, but I'm I'm guessing she was probably the underdog, and I'd heard some great things about her. Um, I hadn't actually seen her box, but I'd heard some really good things, and I remember seeing Jamie Mitchell pretty much manhandle um, Shannon Courtney. Um, so I expected Jamie Mitchell to probably beat Nina Hughes just based on that, but no, it seems like Nina Hughes was able to obviously outbox Jamie over the 10 rounds, and that's brilliant for Nina Hughes, it really is brilliant for Lee Eaton as well, um, excellent stuff really, um, so yeah, tough things there for Jamie Mitchell, who wanted that rematch with Shannon Courtney, and it never seemed like it was ever going to happen for some reason. Moving out now to the O2 Arena in Greenwich, London, United Kingdom. I was at this card. I'm going to start with the undercard. Let's run through these ones real quick. Um, yeah. Um, Pierce O'Leary, now 11-0. and 0. Another one, which was... Um, one that I felt the odds were crazy on. I think he was about seven or eight to one to win the fight on points, and I backed it, so I was happy with that. He's now eleven and zero, a unanimous decision there over ten rounds against a super super tough Emmanuel Munganjaya. Again, I still feel like I'm mispronouncing his name, despite seeing him in person and practicing his name all week. I still don't think I've got it down to a T. This one was for the vacant WBC International Super Lightweight title. Um, yeah, Pierce O'Leary looked good, but this guy, I mean, he was down a few times. I've lost count how many times he was down. But, you know, I said it, He he's Namibian. Some of these Namibian fighters... I've got some kind of special ingredient that you don't really see with other fighters, and I'm being serious. Um, <laughs> this guy, you know, he was teak tough, and I could I could understand why he's never been stopped. He just kept coming. You know, he was taking an absolute shellacking, but he would carry on coming forward, carry on trying to land his own punches, and he still believed he could get the one-punch knockout in the dying seconds of round 10. Um, yeah, unbelievable, unbelievable. A lot of the the other media people I was sat with ringside were getting a bit frustrated, like the fight was kind of dragging out, like you know, because they expected him to blow away this Namibian, but it wasn't to be. Um, we saw Dennis McCann as well. Oh, I'm so annoyed about this. Um, not going to go into a different area on this one, Eddie. But um, obviously, I like to mention you know, little bets and stuff with the boxing, and I, this is a boxing podcast, not a betting podcast, of course, but I've got to say, this guy, Dennis McCann, I expected him to win on points, I thought that he could win on points against Joe Ham, who is quite a, you know, durable, tough guy, stuff like that, um, and if Dennis McCann would have won on points, he didn't, he ended up getting the knockout in round eight, but if he would have won on points, I would have won my 300 to 1 parlay slash accumulator. But this guy, Dennis McCann, <laughs> the one thing that went wrong. Ah, <sighs> devastation. Um, I only had 25 pence on it, but it would have been 75 pounds. I'd have been happy with that. But anyway, Dennis McCann obviously owes it to me. So when I see him, I'm going to ask him for that money. But no, all jokes aside, um, a win here for the vacant Commonwealth title as well. 14-0 and now, Dennis McCann. Um, a TKO in round eight against Joe Ham. It was a scheduled 12. So, um, so yeah, Dennis McCann's improving a lot, I think. I really think the last... The last maybe two to three fights in particular, I feel like he's really improved because there was this time early on in his career, obviously, when he turned over, people were saying this guy's going to be the next Prince Nassim Hamed. You know, the comparisons and the ex exaggerations and all of these things. I think people were just rushing their their expectations of a young a young man, you know, a really young man. We forget how young he is, obviously still baby-faced. But um, I felt that, there was a few fights in a row where people thought, he's going to blow this guy away, and he didn't. He's going to blow this guy away, and he didn't. And I think people were a little bit disappointed, thinking that he maybe didn't deliver in the way that they felt he would have and should have. But I think he has recently got a lot better. 
and we see him finish Joe Ham here. I remember him looking good, I think, last time out as well. So Dennis McCann, I think, is getting better all the time, learning obviously as he's as he's you know as he's fighting. Um, elsewhere on the card, we had Sam Noakes move to 10 and 0 with 10 KOs. He was able to TKO Calvin McCauld in round four. Um, McCauld loses his O. He's now 12 and 1. It was for the WBC International Silver and the Commonwealth Lightweight titles. Um, McCauld down four times in that fourth and final round. I didn't know how many times they were going to let him go down before they stopped it but obviously down from body shots um, sometimes you're given a bit longer uh, a bit more lenient to let it carry on the referee but those body shots were brutal in the end from Sam Noakes um, elsewhere on the card Hamza Shiraz now 17 and 0 he was able to TKO in just two rounds River Wilson Bent who's now 13 and 2 with a draw it was for the vacant Commonwealth and the WBC silver silver middleweight titles um Brutal from Shiraz, brutal. I've got to say, I've never seen his jab, his jab look so good. It was just absolutely perfect. It was a spiteful jab, proper bosh, bosh. It was like, again, I was talking with the other the other media members, and they were saying it's like a straight right hand. This guy's jab is so heavy, so accurate, and it just it just smashed River Wilson Bennett in the face every single time he threw it. He couldn't miss. He could not miss, and. Um, Honestly, I was so impressed, so impressed. Um, like I say, never seen him use his jab like that in the past. Obviously, he usually goes into fights with a height, uh, height advantage. But this one, this particular performance was unbelievable. And on paper, it was set to be a challenge, really, for Hamza Shiraz. Um, but yeah, I just felt it was a massive statement. Again, he's another guy who's getting better and better. Um, a scary prospect in some ways, you know. Perfect performance from him, though. Absolutely punch perfect. And I've got to say, I've said it before. I'm just going to touch on it. We see guys go from the UK to the USA to train. And very rarely do they become the star of the show in the gym. You know, usually they go to a big gym that has other big fighters and they're not the star of the show. You know, they're not perhaps getting that one-to-one -one attention that they really need and are used to getting back here by another trainer. We saw Amir Khan, obviously, with Freddie Roach. We've seen other guys go out in the past. We've seen... Um, Amir Khan as well, go to Terence Crawford's camp. And it's happened many, many times in the past as well. Um, but... I see how much they respect Hamza Shiraz in the Ten Goose Boxing Gym. Um, I think they've got a punch bag up with his initials, HS, on it. You know, they're posting him on all their social media channels. It's clear to see that he's like their golden boy. And it seems to be working really well. Him and Ricky Funes is a brilliant, brilliant, um, you know, uh, connection that they've got. The team is just thriving on each other, really. Um, elsewhere, we had the main event as well. This is a bit of a gut punch, really. Zach Parker now 22-1. and one. He loses here for the first time against John Ryder, who's now 32-5. and five. Um, It goes down as a TKO at the start of round five. It was, of course, for the WBO Interim World Super Middleweight title, which was vacant. Zach Parker pulls himself out. I believe, um, due to an injured right hand. We've seen him post the x-ray pictures since then. It looks horrible, of course. Um, I was scoring the fight round by round up until the stoppage. I'm going to run through that quickly first. Zach Parker, I gave the first round. I felt he won it with his hand speed. Um, it was a bit of a messy round, though. There was a lot of clinching. Round two, I gave to John Ryder. I felt Zach wasn't really showing much head movement. Zach was spending most of his time in Southpaw, switching and stuff, but mainly in Southpaw. John, I felt, was landing, you know, those those um, meaty hooks that he's become known for over the over the last few years, and was jabbing really nicely as well. It was a good close fight after two rounds. Round three was a really close round. I decided to give it a 10-10. I liked Zach's jabs. I liked Ryder's hooks. I felt Zach maybe was moving a bit too much. He was up on his toes, using up energy. Ryder was just standing still, just walking around the ring following him. And Parker, I just felt, was just using up a little bit too much energy when he didn't need to and I noticed that Parker's mouth started to open he was breathing heavy already in round three I'm not sure that's a bad sign there um round four Ryder I, I gave that round um it seemed like Parker was just really uncomfortable that's when I first noticed 
that he looked really uncomfortable to me. He was being tagged. Parker was was forced onto the back foot. John was putting the pressure on. Um, Parker as well seemed maybe hurt once or twice, but I felt credit to John Ryder. He was boxing a fantastic fight thus far. And then, of course, we see at the start of that fifth round, pretty much in between rounds of round four and five, Parker comes out to the middle of the ring, um, to basically have a short conversation with John Ryder to say that he's pulling out the fight. I'm not sure if it was the corner that stopped it. I didn't watch it at home. I haven't watched it back. But in front of my eyes, it, it was as if Parker decided to take it upon himself to... I don't want to say quit. I really like Zach Parker. I think Zach Parker's a super special fighter. But obviously, he's faced adversity for the first time here. He suffered an injury that many a fighter have carried on with. And with this much on the line for him... It's easy for me to say he should have carried on. You know, I'm not feeling the pain he's in. I'm just an observer. But to think that this guy was mandatory for Canelo for two years. This guy was on the brink of a humongous payday against Canelo. Or a title shot for the for the full world title. A vacant title shot. And he could have and probably would have won it. So he's been in this position for such a long time. And that's the only thing going for Zach Parker. Let's be honest, he does not have a massive profile. I was looking at his Twitter followers the other day. He's got about seven or 8,000. I don't know how many he's got on Instagram, but his profile is nowhere near where it should be for being ranked number one in the world. It's just as simple as that. Um, he's not massive into social media and things like that. He's he's kind of old school as a person. He, you know, he's, he's not going to be posting snapchats and things like this that's just not his style he's very very much um you know not into social media too much and it's kind of hampered him a little bit because the profile isn't there maybe someone should be paid to to uh to be his social media guy or whatever but or social media girl but um you know it seems like it's all been thrown away right there and now how does he find his way back in i'm sure he's going to probably uh, stay with Frank Warren. There's probably a contract in place there anyway for for that relationship to continue. But I just felt that he kind of, I don't want to say he threw it all away. I'm really hesitant to point the finger at him because, like I say, I know that he must have been in loads and loads of pain. But to think that it was a close fight up until that point, to think that he was breathing heavy and that he may have took it upon himself to end the fight... Um, it's just a great shame. And I sent him a text message, you know, um, I think it was the day after, just a text message, just to say, look, man, keep your head up, you know, obviously you're going to come back stronger, etc., etc. And, you know, he sent his reply to me. I, I got a hell of a lot of time for Zach and his manager, Neil Marsh. Loved the pair of them, to be honest with you. But um, devastating for him. Devastating. Because, I mean, he's lost his number one ranking. He's lost his, his shot at a title. He didn't get the massive payday that was possibly round the corner if he were to win the fight and go after Canelo. We're now seeing Eddie Hearn reaching out to Canelo on John Ryder's behalf to get him the fight. Could you imagine? I almost don't want that to happen. That would send you into depression if John Ryder got the fight, if you're Zach Parker. But obviously, like I say, I've got huge, huge amounts of time for John Ryder as well. One of my favorite men in the sport. It was tough as well having to sit there and see one guy win and one guy lose, you know, I didn't want either guy to lose, um, but, you know, at the same time, John Ryder was, was winning that fight, I think, as well on the cards, and certainly on my card, and, you know, it was the toughest fight on paper for Zach Parker to have been in, and I think John Ryder, the way things were going, perhaps would have ended up winning, but we'll never know, um, unless we see a rematch with Zach Parker at full fitness, but why, if you're John Ryder, would you do that, I don't think there's any need, he has had too many hard fights in a row, and he really does deserve a crack at a world title. I'd love to see him get that Canelo fight, being brutally honest. Um, obviously, it would be an extremely tough fight, but the payday that would come with it, the recognition that would come with it would be exceptional. And um, if anyone deserves a, a, a big money fight or a big world title shot against someone like Canelo, it's John Ryder. John Ryder has, has been through every tough test put in front of him and he keeps beating good fighter after good fighter. Obviously, 
uh, Zach Parker here, and then before that, Danny Jacobs. The guy's on a heck of a run and seems to be unstoppable. Um, so yeah, unbelievable stuff for John Ryder. I've spoke to him as well. <laughs> he said he wants the Mexican, so we'll see. Um, moving out now to the Wembley Arena. This one clashed as well with the card that I was present at, so I didn't see much of this at all. Dillian White, in the end, was able to eke out a very, very tight majority decision victory. Um, most people felt he lost, by the way, um, from what I've seen. Uh, Dillian White now 29 and 3. Jermaine Franklin loses his O. The big American now 21 and 1 says he was robbed. Again, I haven't seen the fight in its full capacity at all, um, but it seemed like Jermaine Franklin was was doing really well. The tiny bits I saw when I was kind of forwarding it to to, to the last round. Um, elsewhere on the undercard, we had Fabio Wardley move to 15 and oh, I believe he's got the longest knockout streak of any British fighter at the moment. Um, he was able to TKO in three rounds. Nathan Gorman now 19 and two. It was for the vacant. British heavyweight title, Gorman down twice in round two and once in round three. Um, really kind of weird fight, but fun as well while it lasted. And I'll, I'll say that because Gorman had some massive moments. I think it was in round two. Um, and then that was when he was having some success and then Wardley puts him down, of course. At no point in any of the three knockdowns did I think that Nathan Gorman was in huge trouble. Um, eventually, the towel came in, obviously, in that in that, uh, that third round. And I felt it was a little bit premature, in all honesty. Um, you know, it sounds a bit mad to think he'd been down three times and I'm saying it was premature, but he just didn't look hurt at all. His legs were there, his his head seemed screwed on properly. It was just a bit of a weird ending and it was it was a bit of a shame for him as well because he did have success and he did have um, Wardley's nose all busted up. Wardley, I think, was kind of, you know, pouring it all out to try and get the fight stopped as soon as possible. It would have been interesting to see if Nathan would have got past that third round to see how Wardley would have looked in round four because there was only about 30 seconds left when they threw that towel in I think he was pouring it all out in a very risky nature actually um Wardley but you know credit to him he gets the win once again I'm just not sure where his ceiling is I mean is he the best domestic heavyweight we have in the country maybe maybe he is um, but yeah, he seems to again come for every test that's put in front of him, and with flying colours, he's knocking these guys out that we we don't think he's going to knock out, or perhaps knock out as as um, impressively, but he keeps doing it, so credit to him. Elsewhere on the card, again, I didn't see this at all, Sandy Ryan now 5-1, and one. she was able to beat unanimously over 10 two-minute rounds, and Nihi Esther Sanchez, who's now 21-6, and six. that one was for Ryan's WBC International Super Lightweight title. Elsewhere on the card again, um, Chivon Clark. He is now 4-0, a TKO for him in round two against Jose Ulrich, who's now 17-6. Pat McCormack with a points win. I think he was 2-0 with two first-round KOs, if I'm not mistaken, but he went to points over six against Christian Andino, who's now 16-6 with two draws. Moving out now to the Dignity Health Sports Park in Carson, California, USA. Over here, uh, going to touch on the undercard. Two of Fernando Vargas's sons box. They both came out of their fights with wins. Amado Vargas now 5-0, and a unanimous decision over four rounds against Osmar Hernandez, who's now 1-2. and two. Vargas did have a point deducted as well for hitting his opponent while he was down. Um, Hernandez was down as well in round one. Uh, Fernando Vargas Jr., now 7-0, and o, a KO for him in round two against Alejandro Martinez, who's 3-3-1. Three, three and one. Um, Bakadir Jalalov now 12 and 0, a knockout in round four against Curtis Harper now 14 and 9. Harper down in the third and fourth round. Charles Comwell with a win, a majority decision over 10 rounds against Juan Carlos Abreu, former opponent of Jeron Ennis, now 25 and 7 with a draw, but it was close. And I purposely didn't bet on this fight because the odds were crazy. You had to bet 33 dollars to win. To win $34, so to win $1. And I didn't think that Conwell was that big of a favourite because I've seen a brew upset a few guys. He's very, very tough. I think he's from Ecuador or Venezuela or Colombia, somewhere with um, 
somewhere with yellow in the flag um, from that part of of of, of America. Um, but yeah. Um, a majority decision, like I say, Conwell was cut as well from an accidental head clash in round one. Um, so he's now 18 and 0, though. Um, what else did we have on the card? We had Yocasta Val move to 27 and 2. Um, she was able to, to, to beat Evelyn Bermudez, who's now 17 and 1 with a draw, loses her 0. A majority decision over 10 two minute rounds in favor of Yocasta Val. Um, I think that may have been a unification there for the IBF and WBO fly, uh, light flyweight world titles, I should say. And then the main event, Jose Zapida, now 36-3. and three. He was knocked out in the 11th round against Regis Progre, now 28-1. and one. Regis is the new WBC world super lightweight champion. Zapida down in round 11. Um, it was mad, really, wasn't it? Um... I was really surprised with Progray's amount of lateral movement. I know he can be slick at times, but I thought it, it, it was put together really, really well. Very exciting. And he was walking Zapida down while making him miss kind of thing. While being on the front foot, you know, using that lateral head movement that I just said. And I felt he won the early rounds quite comfortably. Um, Zapida did look a little bit bamboozled early on. And I think just... Really and truly, Progre went on to dominate more and more, and then obviously got that stoppage, a superb 1-2 by Regis, right on the button, uh, which which forced Zapida to end up with his back on the ropes, and he kind of fell through the ropes momentarily, kind of got caught in the ropes, and was slightly defenseless for a second, and of course, Regis has to go for it, he goes for it, steams in, hurts Zapida even more, and then obviously when he did come off the ropes, hit him with a, with a few more shots, and the referee stopped it come to a end very very quickly um you did unmute yourself eddie so i'm guessing you've seen it um yeah yeah one, I see it. one very unfortunate thing is that i had um regis on the show a couple weeks ago and sometimes after an interview when we when i stop recording we have a conversation i do this with a lot of fighters and sometimes we have a really juicy conversation and i was talking to regis he's a friend of the show and I said, oh, you know, who's won the purse bids for this fight? And he said, oh, it's a company called Marv Nation and, you know, blah, blah, blah. And I said, the thing about these companies that end up winning a purse bid, you know, you've got to make sure that they're, they're definitely paying you. You know, you've got to make sure. Well, anyway, it seems like I must have um, predicted the future because he's come out this week and said that his check has bounced, Eddie, due to insufficient funds Ooh. from Marv Nation. So he, at the moment, is trying to figure out what's going on. Um, yeah, talk to me about the fight, the card, and uh, if you want wow. the pay. Oh, my gosh. Uh, that, that pay is scary. That's scary. And I think that might have uh, shed a little light on something with, <laughs> with me. But anyway, um, it's the first time I actually sat and had a really – good opportunity to watch Regis pro rate fight. And I was impressed in ways and others was a little bit like, eh, you know, a little underwhelmed in certain spots when we talk, talks about, but I, I didn't know previous that he took up the sport late. I didn't know that. I had no idea. I thought he'd you know, been doing it all his life or whatever. And, and I mean, don't get me wrong. I mean, even if he started when he was 17, that's still pretty late uh, considering, but I mean, I'm not sure exactly when I didn't really find all that out. But I can kind of tell with how he fights. However, he still has a, learned a great deal in whatever the amount of time was that he's been boxing because there were some really good things that I've seen from him. Um, he was really, for some reason, in this fight, he was really disciplined behind the jab. And, you know, it's crazy because not all the time will you see South Bird, Southpaw versus Southpaw. That is kind of rare, you know what I mean, to see two of them fighting each other. But in this kind, in this situation, it, it happened. And what I was impressed with was how, because it's hard sometimes for Southpaws to fight each other, you know what I mean? Because they're not used to it. They see, they see Southpaws is rare and probably even more rare than we do. You know what I mean? Because we're, I, I think obviously more right-handed people that we, we're used to seeing them more than they're used to seeing each other. So um, it's a little bit difficult. It can be a little difficult, but what I see with Regis program, he was able to kind of just deal with it. And he almost looked as if he's used to doing it. And it was just like a righty versus a righty. And he was really disciplined behind the jab. He even was doing some counter right hands, like uh, pull counter right hand. Not right hand, I keep saying right hand, left hands. 
I'm sorry, it's a full counter left hand, which as the fight wore on, it got to be, you know, more and more devastating, more dangerous for uh, Zapata as the fight wore on. And don't get me wrong, Zapata did some good things early. He was he was he was landing a couple clean, clear shots here and there. But I think like I agree with Joe, I agree with you, Joe, that he was pretty much controlling the fight and as it got further. Uh, I think Regis Progre picked it up. The one thing that I can that I'm that I was watching with him is he tended to have that back foot a little bit too far behind his lead foot, especially when stalking Zapata. I think he failed to cut the ring off and was like kind of following him and around the ring at times. When I think <laughs> I mean, maybe I could be nitpicking because I, mean, I think he looked good overall and, and, and obviously did a great job, especially in stopping him late. And uh, But it, it's just like if he was able to cut it off and, and a little bit more in those times, he might have been, he might have been able to get the stoppage a little earlier. But all in all, he gets, a, he gets a really high grade, really good job, good, re- really disciplined behind the jab. And... Uh, Landed some big shots that you could tell he's strong and 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 motivated and and I really like what I saw from him. Uh, aside from the little little small details that he he still think I think he still needs to correct in order to win uh, and beat guys at the highest of high levels like you know like like the Josh Taylors and the Catterall's and stuff like that. He's gonna you know he's gonna have to step up certain things in camp and and strategically uh, over time to uh, to be the top of the top in that division I think well said Eddie and moving on to uh, this card here it was the final card to mention it took place on a Sunday afternoon at the Ali Pali in London it was live on Sky Sports let's talk about the undercard we had Shaquille Thompson move to 9-0 and a TKO in round 3 against Gabor Gorbix who's now 26-35 and with 3 draws we had um Shannon Ryan moved to 4 and 0 friend of the show a point to him for her over 6 2 minute rounds I don't think she has a knockout to her name just yet but she was able to beat Ivanka Ivanova who's now 5 and 21 with three draws I'm not sure if it's a true rumor but apparently Ivanka <laughs> Ivanka Ivanova um she had a fight with um with Roxana Begum who obviously was the Muslim female fighter who didn't tell her family that she boxed went you know trained become a pro fighter and made her debut on a Joe Joyce undercard against Ivanka Ivanova and it was rumored that Ivanka Ivanova was spotted across the road before the fights had started um I think eating a cheese sandwich and chain smoking a pack of cigarettes and uh, she ended up getting in the ring and beating Roxana Begum unbelievable then um, they had a rematch about two or three years later because Roxana Begum went away trained every day and then come back and I think lost again to Ivanka Ivanova but anyways Ivanka Ivanova was on the losing end here on on, on points to to a friend of the show Shannon Ryan um we also had Reese Edwards move to 13 and 0, a points win there over six rounds against Alexis Cabor, who's a really tough guy. I remember him fighting Archie Sharp. He's now 29 and 7. We saw Hassan Azim get a points win over six rounds against Nesta Amokoto, who's now 2 and 4 with a draw. Hassan Azim 5 and 0. We had Sam Gilly, friend of the show, now 15 and 1, a unanimous decision there over 10 rounds against Sean Robinson, who's now 11 and 2 with a draw. That one was for the English Super Welterweight title. Sam Gilly did put Sean Robinson down in round six. Um, we had Adam Azim move to 7-0. and oh, A knockout against Ryland Charlton in round two. He had him down twice in round one. Ryland, Char- Ryland, Ryland Charlton seriously overmatched when you look back at it now. It's, it's easy to say that in hindsight. I think it was a good fight on paper, especially for Azim's just his seventh fight. Um, Ryland Charlton now 9-4 and four with a draw. Um, yeah, he, I mean, he can punch. He's a full-time pro now, which he hasn't been before. He said he was feeling a lot better. He's in the best physical shape and stuff like that. His body is unbelievable. Massive, massive arms. His back, you know, he's full of muscles, the guy. Not huge for the weight in terms of his height, but what a power powerhouse and that's his nickname the pint size powerhouse is perfect for him but he got banged out by Adam Azim who continues to look 
very, very impressive. They're tipping him for super high things. You got his trainer Shane McGuigan, son of Barry McGuigan, saying that this is the most talented fighter I've ever worked with, and you've got to kind of think that there's a lot of guys in that in that um, in that realm, like the guys that he's trained in the past. That's that's the huge impressive list, and he's saying Azim's the most talented. I mean, we're talking about some of the guys he's he's trained, Josh Taylor. We're talking about George Groves. We're talking about Carl Frampton, David Hay. I mean, wow, wow. That's huge praise there for Adam Azim. Um, and also on the card, Mikel Lawal now 17-0. and 0, He was able to beat former foe um, of his, a rematch, obviously, this one. Uh, he was able to beat David Jameson, who's now 9-2. and 2. Jameson... Uh, was pulled out, I believe, by his corner in round eight. That one was for the vacant British cruiserweight title. He had a badly broken jaw, I believe, Jameson in the end. So Lawal um, gets the win in what was quite a close fight, really, up until the stoppage, I felt. Um, but yeah, that wraps up the review part of the show. The final thing for me to do in this segment is to welcome this week's special guest. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the undefeated Commonwealth lightweight champion. He's from Maidstone. His hands are made of stone. It is, of course, Mr. Sam Noakes. Sam, welcome back on the show. How's that for an intro? <laughs> oh, mate, that was brilliant. I was loving that. That was good. You're going to have to get you on the old fight night, mate, doing that. That's brilliant. <laughs> So, Sam, we last spoke back in March. It was fight week for your fight against uh, Vincenzo Finiello. Um, it was a few days before the fight. I ended up being ringside for that one as well. You managed to get him out in round four. Um, he'd never been stopped. I did love, though, that after the fight, he put you on his shoulders and carried you around the ring like a human trophy. Um, oh, tell no. me tell me about that fight. It was a good win. Well, yeah, it was good. I mean, I had... Um... I hurt my hand in the last spar of camp against Elliot Wawa. I hit him with um, an uppercut. My hand just swelled up like, you know, like when you've got the rubber gloves at the petrol station and you blow air in them and it goes up like that. So it was, I had that leading up to the fight. I mean, um, I couldn't do no pads in the change room. Even when I put my hand in the glove, it was sore. So I was happy with to get the stoppage anyway. But, I mean, yeah, when he went down and get me on his shoulders, I was thinking, what's happening here? Like, I thought he wanted me to get down next to him and do, I thought, well... <laughs> I don't know what was going on, but then, yeah, when he lifted me out, I think, oh, if he drops me, I'm not going to be very happy. <laughs> Swollen ankle as well. <laughs> I imagine that, mate. I thought, but I just thought it was a little bit, like, obviously, he was happy to do it, and he was a nice fella, and that, but I don't know, it was, it was a little bit, felt a little bit embarrassed doing it, and that. it was a bit weird, I thought. <laughs> it was funny, it was funny. It was cool to see, obviously, um, good sportsmanship on, on, uh, on yeah, his yeah. side. Um, yeah, and obviously this brings us perfectly on to my next question. Another guy who hadn't been beaten before, let alone stopped, had the displeasure of stepping into the ring with you on the weekend. Obviously, Calvin McCauld, you get him out in four rounds as well. Um, tell me about the fight from inside the ropes. On paper, it was probably set to be your toughest fight. Yeah, I mean, that's exactly how I was looking at it as well. Like, I mean, obviously... He, he'd had over 100 amateur fights as well. He was coming to win. He seemed pretty confident in the build-up, as in, like, when I see him at the media day, the press conference, like, he was saying that he'd seen things that he, in my previous fights, that he reckons he can beat me and all, all things like that. So I knew he was going to be a live opponent. I mean, he was an absolute pleasure as well to share a ring with. I mean, he, I've been lucky that I've had, like, 10 good opponents and none of them have been, like, been arseholes, really. Do you know what I mean? So, but... I thought I hit him with a left hook in the first round and I sort of see his face change a little bit and then he come out in the second round and I know obviously he can't go off it but he, like his hair was all messed up and he just looked like he had a few signs of distress in his face and I thought, well, if I just keep on him a little bit longer, see how it goes and then after the third, I think you, the distress, distress was um, quite clear to see and then that first body shot, I caught him within the fourth round. I, it wasn't even like I was loading up with it. It was more just... Um, like, yeah, you do a double jab to the head and then you drop down to the body. Do you know what I'm saying? And then when he went down, I thought, of course, sweet. And then just ended up loading in the body shots after that. Yeah, I was going to say, because obviously the body shots in particular were were brutal, some of them. Um, as I say, I was, I was sat ringside. Um, usually, when we see a knockout, of any kind, just as a fan, I'm sure you've, you've seen it before, we can usually identify what 
the punch was if you if you know what I'm saying like that was the shot that, that was the shot that hurt him and the other punches were kind of just follow ups but to be honest obviously you had him down four times I think every punch you landed to the body was more and more hurtful I don't think it was necessarily one shot and the others were follow ups it just seemed like there was many uh, big shots <laughs> no, if you know what I'm saying yeah I think once once he uh, once he took the knee after the first one everything after that I thought well wow, I've got him here because it was, what, what, it was what, like 30 seconds into the fourth round. It worked. Like, I still had plenty of time there. After that, I was just whipping in some big ones. Every, everyone was meaning to hurt him. Do you know what I'm saying? And then, uh, obviously, he, like, fair play to him. He tried to him back. But, obviously, as he's thrown back, he's opened up. And a few got through the middle. And I think that was, uh, they were the ones doing the real damage. Yeah, I agree. I agree. And you wanted to be 10 and 0 with 10 KOs. You finally got there. We had Archie Sharp on the show last week. I asked him about your upcoming fight. And I said, even though I'm sure you want Sam to win, I bet secretly you don't want him to get the KO. We laughed. But, you know, in all seriousness, yeah. you've overtooken uh, Archie there. You've got the most KOs in the gym. Um, what does this mean to you on a personal level, Sam? I mean, obviously, the gym's flying at the beginning. Anyway, that's just, you know, like your own little games that you're playing. That, I mean, yeah. I thought it, like, in my head it's more just like having not as not the, as many fights as the other boys, but I want to try and keep that KO weight high. Do you know what I'm saying? But for me, it was more I needed. I wanted to get out of ten and ten. Like I've not gone into all the other fights saying, um, right, I'm going to stop this geezer. Do you know what I'm saying? Not like, normally it's the the generic. Yeah, I want to stop it, but I'm not going to go looking for it. Do you know what I mean? If it comes, it comes. But this this fight, I've, the only option I had used to stop him because I mean I wanted that 10 and 10 bad because I remember remember before I turned pro but if you were even thinking about turning pro it was I was chatting with my mate Josh Lewis about Anthony Fowler was 10 and 9 I think 10 wins 9 stoppages and I remember thinking like cool that's that's some record and like he was like yeah imagine getting 10 and 10 and I thought cool that would be good and then obviously like a few years later I've managed to bag myself 10 stoppages <laughs> And will we see a difference in your fighting style now that you don't want to necessarily go for the KO, or is it all about trying to catch uh, up Artur Baturbiev? Uh, listen, listen, if it ain't broken, don't fix it. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> but I think it's more just—I don't think the fighting will change. It's more just the pressure that I sort of put on myself with it. Yeah. yeah. Do you know what I mean? Like, for, for like obviously, you still want the stoppages, but realistically, winning at all costs is the only option. Do you know what I mean? So. I think it's more the pressure that I put on myself is what I'm going to leave behind now. Do you know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. That's a good thing, of course. Um, since we last spoke, Sam, your brother has turned pro as well. He's currently 3-0. and He did incredibly well to stop MJ Hall, by the way, in his second pro fight. Um, what's it been like seeing your brother turn over and, I guess, doing the pro journey together? Yeah, I mean, he's been smashing it, to be fair. It's good to see him training hard, fighting and winning. I mean, realistically, he's been the pro boxer of the family this year. He's had three fights, since, and I've only had one. Like, in the time since he turned pro, he's had three, and then I've only had the one. So when the people ask, I say, he's the boxer of the family, not me. I was like, I'm an old has-been. Duke, obviously, I had the old injury in that. So, but yeah, he's flying. I mean, he's loving it. I think he like he, he wants to be on um He wants us to be on the same show really bad. I think that's what he wants. We ain't boxed on the same show for years now. I think, what, six, seven years, maybe? It's been since we've been on the same one, so I think if we can get that next year, I think that'd be really good. And obviously, you picked up the Commonwealth over the weekend. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's a good major title. What is next for you? What's the uh, the next step for you, ideally? I think the plan is we're going to make a few defences, and then obviously no one spoke to me about it. But wherever the British title may be back end of next year, I'd like to I'd like to get that as well. Okay, and that's currently so, with Gavin Gwynn, yeah. yeah. Gavin Gwynn, yeah, I mean, so I don't know what his plans are, but um, that's that's what I want in my head. I would, I'd like to get that British start before I push on any any further, do you know what I mean? We've still got, it's still early days, although I've had 10 and 10, but I've still got a lot of learning to do, do you know what I'm saying? Like, the end goal is obviously to be a world champion, and there's no rush for that. I mean, even if I got there at 28, 29, I'd still be a happy, like, a happy man with it all. So I think... Just keeping my feet firmly on the ground. I want to learn and adapt better as a fighter against different styles, harder opponents, and then yeah, just just keep winning. The plan, really. 
And I've got this rule on the podcast, every December, anyone that I interview throughout the month of December, I like to ask them what's on their Christmas wish list in terms of their career um, for the following year. So my question would be, what's on your Christmas wish list in a realistic world? Um, where do you want to, where do you kind of want to be this time at the end of next year? I do feel like I kind of half asked you that question in the, yeah. in the, in the question before, but if you want to add anything to that, um, yeah, what can yeah. you tell me? Well, my Christmas wish list ideally would be thirteen and oh, thirteen KOs and the, <laughs> the British champion. And fight on a card that's, with your brother Sean. Yeah, oh yeah, and fight on a card with my brother Sean. But go. that that's gonna happen regardless within the future. I know that will happen. But the other the other two is what not I'd want the most, you know what I'm saying? That'd be unreal. Excellent. And my last real question for you, Sam, um, we've got Fury Chisora 3 this weekend, obviously a, a massive uh, stadium fight. Um, two questions. Are you going, and how do you think the main event plays out? Uh, I'm not going. I've got my um, my friend's birthday, Saturday, okay. and uh, all the boys who obviously come support me every night, like, they've been to every one of my fights, they're all going. And I want to uh, spend some time with them, do you know what I mean? Because they're always coming out and spending like spending their money on me to come watch me as well. So I'm going to go and have a good crack with the boys. It's just, unfortunately, it fell on the same day as the Fury fight. But So I'm not, I won't be going. But I still think it's a good fight. I think the reason some people are giving it a bit of bad press is because, obviously, we've, had, we've been teased with the uh, chance of maybe Fury AJ. Do you know what I'm saying? So, obviously, with all them other mixed opponents and things, and then now he's fighting Chisora. That's why I know some people have said, they see a bit online saying he's a pointless fight and all that. But I think, I think it'll still be an entertaining matchup. Yeah, we hope so. I think a lot of people obviously remember that second fight. Um, I think it was eight years ago now. Obviously, it wasn't too competitive. We saw the towel come in, but um, hopefully it's a good one. Let's just say that. Um, and just finally, Sam, if you've got any closing words before we let you go, just to the listeners, if you want to thank any sponsors, if you want to say anything in a final message, take it away, my man. The floor is yours. Yeah, I just want to thank all my sponsors, all the boys who come out and support me since day one as well. And uh, I'd like you to send me over that intro you said in a text message because that was the bollocks. I'll, I'll rate that. Stone, what was it? The Maidstone with the hands of stones from Maidstone or something like that? I like that, mate. Something like that. <laughs> yeah, that was good. But yeah, just thanks for having me again, mate. No, it's my pleasure, my man. It always is a pleasure speaking with you. Congrats once again on the win at the weekend. I also want to wish you a Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. And we'll speak again in 2023. Thank you very much. And you, mate. Okay, now it's time for part two on this week's show. This part, of course... Usually the news, nothing to mention at this moment, so I will touch on any news at the very end of the show if we have any. Moving on to the preview part of the show, this one takes place tomorrow at the Newcastle Arena in Newcastle, United Kingdom. It's live on Channel 5, which is really good because I think that means that we've had um, boxing on terrestrial TV two Fridays in a row. So Channel 5 are delivering for us. Um, Two really good fights as well on the card. Um... A slightly under the radar one, Lyndon Arthur, friend of the show, now 20 and 1. He gets in with Joel McIntyre, who's 20 and 4. That's a good fight there at light heavyweight. Good comeback fight for Lyndon Arthur. He should be able to deal with Joel McIntyre, I would have thought. Um, and the main event's a brilliant fight, obviously a northeast clash. Um, we're going to see friend of the show, Troy Williamson, 19 and 0, with a draw, getting in with friend of the show, Josh Kelly, 12 and 1, with a draw. Um, It's for the British Super Worldweight title, which of course belongs to Williamson. I think this would be his second defence, if I'm not mistaken. Um, It's a fight he's wanted for a long, long time. Obviously, Josh Kelly with the massive profile and stuff like that, it's vital that he wins. Because if he loses, he's in some serious trouble. He really is. But obviously, Williamson is... Um, is is undefeated. Um, Josh Kelly, as an amateur, had a really good amateur career. Williamson didn't have that amateur career. Um, and like I say, Josh Kelly's got the big profile, obviously was with Sky Sports. Troy Williamson was with Frank Warren. It's now, um, this one's a, a Sauerland show. It's ending up on, on terrestrial TV, which is really good, I think, the exposure for both guys, but particularly Troy Williamson, who is super hungry to win this fight and really thinks he's going to win. I think he thinks he's going to stop Josh Kelly. Tried to get Josh Kelly on the show, didn't manage to do it. Troy Williamson obviously has been on a few times. Um, so yeah, 
yeah, all the best to both men there. May the best man win. Uh, this one, this one takes place on Saturday at the Paradise City Plaza in South Korea. Not a place we go to too much. And if I'm not mistaken, I think one of the promoters of the show is former IBF Super Featherweight World Champion Masayuki Ito, who of course lost his title to Jamel Herring. There we go. Um, on this card, we're going to see John Real Casimero of the Philippines, now um, 31 and 4. He gets in with Ryo Akaho, who's 39 and 2 with two draws. If I'm not mistaken, I'm pretty sure Casimero's still world champion. I think. I don't know what's happened. I think his last fight he boxed Rigondo. And beat Rigondo. Um, so I'm not sure. But there's no belt on the line here. It's over 10 rounds. And I didn't even know this guy was still boxing. But Johnny Gonzalez, um, <laughs> 69 and 11 with a draw, gets in here over 10 rounds with Takuya Watambe, who is 38 and 11 with a draw. Um, cool, Johnny Gonzalez, this is about to be his 80 second pro fight man crazy uh, moving out now to the Tottenham Hotspur Stadium Eddie I'm gonna be there I'm super super happy to say I'm gonna be there top of the bill Tyson Fury 32-0 with a draw defending his WBC heavyweight world title against Derek Jisora who's 33-12 and um, the last time these two men fought you were on the undercard I walked you out to the ring it was a fantastic time um, I think what was that eight years ago now which seems mad but um yeah time flies tyson fury seems to have got better and better i think Derek jasora has regressed it's not really yeah. the trilogy anyone wanted to see but i mean we're we're both um admirers of tyson fury so let's keep it short but um thoughts on the fight okay. thoughts on the fight honestly i mean i didn't i didn't think that this would be the fight that you know would take place but you know i think you know, this is something he wants to do, I guess, again, for the, you know, for the UK, I think in more so for um, Derek Chisora. Uh There's really nothing to gain from it. You know, it's, it's I, honestly, with Tyson, I mean, the only thing that he could do is, you know, lose credibility, you know what I mean? If, if somehow he struggled or, God forbid, lost, which I just don't see that being possible. Um I, it's just it, it. There's the style matchup is just not good for Chisora. We've seen we've seen this fight twice. The first time, you know, being when Chisora was you know more himself and and was able to you know he was Chisora. He was coming at you no matter what what you did. He you know he'd come at you. And Tyson won that. So the second fight when I was there, it, it was a mismatch. I knew it from day one in camp when the, when the fight was signed for. And it was going to happen. I knew he wasn't going to be able to stand up to what I've been dealing with uh, <laughs> in camp at that time. So um, in this fight, you know, he's gotten even better since then. He's, you know, he's, he's on top now. His, his, his body of work speaks for itself up to this point. Uh, and, and Derek Chisora has been in some wars. He's done some things recently. I mean, Hasn't obviously looked the greatest up to toward the end now because he's he's been in a lot of tough fights. He just looks older than, you know, he looks too. He looks. He doesn't look like he's going to be capable of dealing with what Tyson is bringing to the table at this point in his career. I just don't see it. Not even. I don't see it being competitive. And there's no dig at this fight in particular. I just don't see it being competitive. I don't. I don't think. Uh, I mean, honestly, I never thought he would be competitive with Tyson, but it's even even less now. So, um, you know, props to him though. He's he's going to get a, a a heck of a payday, and you know, if he gets some bumps from it, you know, it is what it is. Sometimes you got to do what you got to do to get what you need, you know. And uh, you know, he's had a hell of a career. I just hope he doesn't get hurt too bad in there. Yeah, for sure. I can't see it being too competitive. I think it ends with a Tyson Fury knockout probably quite quick to be honest with you uh, they're saying that they're going to meet in the middle and just bang it out I think it was Tyson Fury who said we should do that Derek Chisora of course said yep yeah, that's good we should do that probably not going to see that happen but obviously um, you've got to favour Fury massively it's almost like he's giving a friend a payday I think um, on the undercard a good fight as well for the WBA regular heavyweight world title Daniel Dubois 18 and 1 gets in with South Africa's Kevin Lorena who's 28 and 1 former cruiserweight I mean I say it's a good fight it's going to be good to see Daniel Dubois fight again um, 
Obviously, last time out, beat Trevor Bryan. Um, so it's, it's always good to see him fight. Never really need any judges most of the time. Um, on the undercard as well, Yvonne Mendy of France. Bit of a random fight. I'm not sure how this one has ended up on the card, to be honest with you. But Yvonne Mendy, 47-5 and five with a draw, defending his EBU European lightweight title over 12 rounds against Denis Berenchik. Um, not to be confused with Ivan Baranchik, but yeah, Dennis Berenchik, he's the guy that's walked out to the ring in some crazy ring walks before. There was one where he was in like a prison uniform with, he was handcuffed. Um, he's walked out before, I think, and smashed through some sugar glass and stuff. Um, I don't know if we're going to see anything extravagant, to be honest with you, on the weekend. But anyways, 16-0. I think he's from the Ukraine, if I'm not mistaken, but... I mean, he's supposed to be quite a good prospect, but he's been moved quite slowly, I think. Like, he's only 16, and I think he's been a pro for quite a while, um, if I'm not mistaken. This is all off the top of my head. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe he's only been a pro for five years, but seems like he's not been that active. He's only had 16 fights. I don't really think it's enough, but all the best to both men there. Um, don't really have a horse in that one. Um, we also have Carol Itauma, 8-0 in an eight-rounder against Vladimir Belujski who's 12-5 and five with a draw. Um, and then pretty much the rest of the card is just Tyson Fury's friends or family members. We're going to see Jose Aberton, 27-3 and three in a six-rounder at Cruiserweight. No opponent just yet, it seems. And we're going to see Isaac Lowe, friend of the show, 21-2 and two with three draws in a six-rounder against Sandeep Barty, who is 8-4. and four. Um, Yeah, that's that. Moving out now to the final card to mention, which takes place at the Gila River Arena in Glendale, Arizona, USA. It's going to be live on the zone straight after the Fury fight, pretty much. So it's get home, get it on the TV. Um, (laughs) The main event's obviously going to be fantastic, but let's touch on the undercard fights. Firstly, we're going to see Diego Pacheco, one of the top prospects in world boxing, so a lot of people say. Um, 16 and 0, like I say, getting in with Ricardo Luna, who's 24 and 8 with two draws. That one's over 10 rounds at super middle for the WBC United States title. Elsewhere on the card, we're going to see um, Joselito Velasquez, who is 15 and 0 with a draw in a 10 rounder here at Flyweight against former world champion Christopher Rosales, who's 34 and 6. That's the guy that. Um, Knocked out Daigo Higa, took his O, and then come to London and uh, lost to Charlie Edwards. Charlie Edwards become world champion. He also lost to Andrew Selby. Um, I think he dropped Selby as well. Um, yeah, moving up the card, another man who fought Andrew Selby, Julio Cesar Martinez, 18-2, and two, defending his WBC flyweight world title against Samuel Carmona, who's 8-0. and zero. Um, Martinez, I, think, I don't think he's boxed since he got really beaten up by Chocolatito. So um, I'm assuming he probably moved up in weight to box Chocolatito at Superfly. I can't remember correctly, but obviously he's still champion of the world at Fly. So I'm guessing he's moved back down now. Um, he got absolutely outclassed by Martinez, didn't he? Uh, sorry, by, by Gonzalez that night. But yeah, it's going to be good to see him back though. Hopefully he's as exciting as ever with his um, face first style. Um, and the main event for the vacant WBC World Super Flyweight title, we're going to see Juan Francisco Estrada, 43 and 3, getting in with Roman Chocolatito Gonzalez, 51 and 3. Um, obviously, this is, I believe, the, I think it's the third fight that they've had. Um, Chocolatito won the first one back in 2013, uh, not 2013, back in um, 2012, and lost the second one back in 2021 split decision there over 12 rounds i should say the first one as well was unanimous for chocolatito um obviously the second one like i say a a split decision for estrada and then this and i think that was one of the best fights of last year as well and then this one um the the third one so it's one apiece and uh, we're going to see who the best man is for the third time but always a great fight um when these two get in 
both of the first two have been excellent. I think particularly the second one. And um, it's just always a pleasure to watch Roman Chocolatito Gonzalez fight. So I will be tuned in to watch that one. Love seeing him fight. Such a skillful fighter. Um, one fight I just missed actually on the undercard. Mark Castro, the fighter who probably has the best teeth in boxing. Uh, he's got he's got a brilliant set of teeth. 8-0 um, and in an 8-rounder against Michael Villagrana, who is 16-3. and three. But anyway, that's it for the pre review part of the show in part one we did the review part we welcomed our special guest after that in part two there was no news to mention but we did do the preview part the final thing for me to do before i wrap up this show is to come in with the outro which i'll do in just a few seconds Okay, and this wraps up episode 372 of the Box Hard Podcast. I've been your host, Joey Coastman. Eddie Chambers has been with me for the duration of the show. A huge thank you to this week's special guest, the undefeated Commonwealth lightweight champion, Sam Noakes. The biggest thanks of all, though, goes out to you, the listeners. There has been one or two pieces of news break whilst we've been recording the show. We're going to see a fantastic fight, really, between Chris Eubank Jr. and Liam Smith. It's going to be going down on January 1st live on Sky Sports box office it's going to be at the AO Arena in Manchester really good all British fight there um in other news, we're going to see this one as well taking place at the Turning Stone, uh, the Turning Stone Resort and Casino in uh, in New York, USA. We're going to see a heavyweight double header. We're going to see Effia Jagba getting there with Oscar Rivas and Guido Vianello of Italy getting in there with Stephen Shaw. Um, that will be, I thought it would be for a. Uh, for, for some kind of bridge weight title, but no, it's not. It's going to be, obviously, at heavyweight, um, Oscar Rivas and Effie Jagba. Decent fight, that, actually. I think that's quite an interesting one. Again, the date for that, January 14th, at the Turning Stone Resort and Casino in Verona, New York, USA. That's about everything from myself, though. Um, thanks once again for listening to this week's podcast. If you do have a spare minute, please leave us a review on iTunes. Like I say, that's all from me. Take care. Everybody, stay safe, enjoy your weekends, and we'll see you all again next week.